Hello and welcome to another episode of the Jimmy Rex Show. And today I got the chance to sit here with a good friend of mine, Mr. Rob Sperry. And uh, Rob, it's a pleasure to be here, man. Hey, it's always fun chatting with you. We get to chat about networking and a lot of fun topics. Yeah, no. so Rob is the foremost expert on networking that I know. I know a lot of people, that's kind of what I speak on a lot is networking and things like that. But a lot of the principles I've actually learned and that I've studied, I've learned from you, from Rob. And you recently uh, published a book, in fact, The Game of Networking. Absolutely, yeah. I, I started and I remember meeting with you about this during lunch and we were talking about networking and What's the formula for networking? And everybody always wants to know, how do I network? But when we think about it, it's never ever taught in school for the most part. I don't know of, maybe it is somewhere, but there isn't a class on how to network. And everybody always says, it's not what you know, it's who you know, which I would say it's probably a little bit of both, right? It's what you know, it's who you know, and who knows you. Well, who's, who you know is going to be determined upon what you know a lot of times, I guess I would say that sense. But yeah, there's nowhere to like, there's no class to go to to learn how to network. And even all the books that I read. So I went through all these different books and I'm trying to figure out this formula for networking and they all had smorgasbord of ideas. They had these good ideas, good concepts, good tips, good tricks, good insights, good secrets, whatever you want to call them. But none of them had, you do this, 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 and then, so then I started going to every single million dollar earner that I knew because previous to networking, consulting, coaching, speaking, I was running a tennis club. And so I went to all these successful people and I said, hey, what's the formula for networking? And every single one of them would give me a different answer and they'd think about it. And those same people I'd ask them six months later and it was a different answer. So I thought, you know what? I might as well write a book and it took me, as you know, way too long. I don't know if it's impressive or embarrassing, but it took me seven to eight years to actually take all of that information, organize it and finally create a book that don't worry, it's not too long. It's only 109 pages now. Well, no, it's great. And that, well, and that's to back up a little bit. I kind of dove into that with the whole networking thing, because that's kind of what you are the expert in. But you also, I mean, you speak and train and coach companies all over the world. I think you told me you got recently you got a, a, a speaking gig coming up in Australia. You got one coming up in New Zealand and Europe. And, and it's been fun to watch as you've kind of grown because we've kind of grown together the last 10 years. I've known you for quite a while now. And we apply a lot of the same principles. We teach each other a lot of cool things. And so it's fun every time we sit down and go to lunch. I'm learning a ton. You're learning a ton. You're one of those people that I just have it on the calendar every three months. We're going to do lunch and we're going to learn from each other. So tell us a little bit since you've launched the book, um, what kind of response have you gotten from that? And what are kind of, we'll, we'll go into the book in more detail, kind of these networking yeah. principles, but what was that like finally getting this book out there that you've been working on for so long? Well, at first it was a burden, right? Because you have all this information, you're excited. But at the same time, it was more of an accomplishment. It's not that books you make all this money on. I look at books these days and it's more of a book is an expensive business card that helps gives you credibility. But at the same time, for me, it was a great learning lesson of trying to learn specifically of what we do to network, how we're able to network, and break down those principles, break down those laws so that somebody could come in and understand it. And so I tried to take very complicated, complex principles and make them very simple and then go more and more and more in depth. And so it's been a lot of fun. It has open doors as far as speaking. It has open doors as far as coaching and consulting and different things like that. And more than anything, it's helped me the most because you know when you want to provide content, it's the same thing for you. When you want to teach something, you got to start learning exactly, wait, why do I do what I do? Why do other people do what they do? And so I think it helps you to learn even more So you can do that. And that was the same thing for me as a tennis coach. I haven't ever asked you this. I bet it was the same thing for you as a baseball coach. You play baseball and then you start coaching baseball and you probably started thinking, wait, why do I do that? Why do I do this specifically? How can I teach that? Because good leaders, they have vision. Good leaders always say, I'm going to do whatever it takes. But great leaders learn how to give vision. They know how to communicate that vision. As Stephen Covey, he says that the definition of leadership was You've got the ability to communicate to one their worth and potential so well, they see it in themselves. So you want to become a great leader, transfer from good leader to great leader. You've got to give that vision. Wow, that's great. Well, I love the idea of like, I think too often people think a leader is somebody that everybody else is looking to or looking at as this great person. But in reality, the best leaders empower everybody else to think that about themselves, right? Same kind of principle. Yep, it's it's empower self because first you have to have 
some of that credibility. It doesn't matter if you're more quiet or if you're loud. Jimmy is an extrovert, as everybody knows <laughs> that knows him. And he knows, for me, I feel like I'm yelling at the top of my lungs right now because I'm naturally an introvert. An introvert doesn't mean you're shy. You can be an ambitious introvert, but I'm just chill. And Jimmy knows that. But you have to create some sort of credibility first. So empower self, then empower others. I mean, look at it this way. If Warren Buffett says exact same things that Jimmy says, or I say, they're going to have 110 times, or 10 times, 100 times, 1,000 times, 10,000 times more profound impact because he's created that credibility. Right. Whereas the same thing, if, if somebody goes and says the same thing that I say or Jimmy says that's never made more than $1,000 in a month, it's going to have much less credibility. So first, yes, you've got to go create your greatness once in something. It doesn't matter what it is. It could be in sports. It could be a musical talent. It could be in school. It could be at your job, whatever it is. Then you parlay that credibility, hopefully into more credibility, but now you can empower others because you've you've created that. That helps you. Oh, that's perfect. It's very well worded. I, I, it's too often people want to go into the coaching and consulting business and they've never really done anything yet, right? I think it's one of my advantages. I'm launching this course that you've helped me with a little bit, the 100K agent uh, blueprint, which I'm going to teach agents how to make a hundred grand their first six months as a real estate agent. And I've sold almost 2000 homes now as an agent. I, of all the real estate coaches that are out there, I don't know anybody that's sold more personally than I have in this industry. And that's going to be my big, uh, that's going to be my big advantage of, as com you know, compared to some of these other coaches that have more credibility currently or have a bigger audience and things like that. So I love that idea. So is that one of the principles that you teach in the book? And give us a couple, start us out, a couple of the main things. If somebody's listening to this, they're like, I hate networking. Like networking's just not something I want to put my time and effort towards because you are an introvert. And I give you a lot of credit because I've seen how you have strategically gone about to create situations where you're able to network with people. Like I know even just like the Lake Pal trip you put together a couple of years ago, yeah. you invited me to kind of help you kind of host that event. You had a hundred people there and you were life of the party for a guy that's an introvert. It's an impressive <laughs> thing to see. So give us a little bit, um, introverted person or somebody that just doesn't really care to network, but knows the value of it. Give us a few of your principles and, and successes that you can use in order to kind of come out of that shell. So bit. first off, yeah, after that we after that Lake Pal trip, I think I had to go rest for a week because <laughs> there were so many people there, right? And for you, you're just like, oh yeah, that's just normal. Another no, I, liter trip. I literally had another group coming like a week <laughs> of later. Of course, right? <laughs> and then the next thing I would say is I know you're a big, big Tony Robbins fan. So Tony Robbins says it best. He says, our decisions are based on our association to pain and pleasure. So you think about it, for me, networking, I looked at it as, as my goal was time freedom. I wanted to be able to be that, that dad, that husband, that friend, that neighbor, that person that I could do whatever I want, whenever I want. Every single person, time's the most valuable thing we have in this life. It's the most valuable thing. It's the only thing you can't get more of. Yep. You want to go do humanitarian trips and you say, I don't care about money. Well, you got to have some money to be able to go do humanitarian trips. You want to be able to, whatever, house, car, uh, family trips, friend trips. I don't care what it is. It's time. Go achieve your passenger your dreams. So I look at it, the association of pain and pleasure. You're going to go to the gym and you're starting out and it's the January New Year's resolution. I got this. I got this. And if you're associating it to more pain, then you will be done in a couple weeks. But if you associate to pleasure of this is how I feel, this is how I look, whatever is most important to you, maybe it's ball. And then you're going to be able to stick with it. So for me now, there's more pain missing going to the gym, right? More pain missing than there is going. There's more pleasure going. So now I am going to consistently go. It's the same thing for networking. Even though for me, it was completely out of my comfort zone. I looked at it and I said, you know what? I'm not the smartest guy. I know I'm not the fast starter. I know I'm not the most charismatic. I know I've learned a lot of those traits, but I know that I'm not the person that's going to go up to everybody and I'm not going to be the natural networker. But you know what? I do, do love people. And if I can just be the best version of me, not try to be a different me, because I've tried to do that. I've tried to follow. Yeah, that's a, like, I think that's the worst thing you can do in networking is try to be somebody you're not. Like, I've opened more doors by being ridiculous than probably any other character trait about me. Like, just doing something, giving somebody an experience where they're like, that guy doesn't, you know, he doesn't even give a rip. And they love it because secretly, I think they all would like to be able to just be that free-spirited person. And so the last thing you 
you want to do if you're trying to network, and then I'll shut up and let you continue the point, but is to try to be that person that you're not, to try to be any kind of energy that you don't normally, you know. And I've tried that, and people are like, dude, what are you doing? What are you saying? I'm like, I don't know. I'm sorry. So I had to learn just, okay, what are the principles? You can learn principles from extroverts, introverts, and stop applying the technique so much. Learn the principles. Yes, the world loves boldness. It makes people curious. It's contagious. But just because you see an extrovert that's bold, maybe because they're loud, doesn't mean you have to be loud. You find a way to be the bold version of yourself. So I started learning that and I started seeing, okay, you know what? I want that time freedom with my family. I want to be that husband. I never miss. I do date night every single week when I'm in town. Last year, I did six family trips. I, do fam I took my wife. We went to Europe for two weeks and she's coming with me again this year to Europe. She's coming with me to Australia and I'm going to probably do six or seven family trips this year. So I looked at that and I saw that vision and I said, you know what? It's going to be painful. A lot of it's going to suck. Darren Hardy says, right, in the Entrepreneur Roller Coaster, you hate 95% of what you do, but you got to love the why. Mm. And everybody always says, your why's got to make you cry. And it sounds so cliche. And cliches are cliches for a reason, right? Because they're timeless principles. But at the same time, do your actions really back up your why? Because everybody says, I want the time freedom. I want to spend time with my family and friends. I want to do the humanitarian trips. Really? Because are your actions backing up that? So for me, it was the most uncomfortable thing in the world. But I got out of my comfort zone because I wanted it that bad, because I was that ambitious, because there was, even though the pain was way up here, I saw the pleasure as right here. And that's where I said, okay, and we can go into the networking principles or lies. But that's why, for me, I was willing, and you know, because you've seen it over the last 10 years, and we actually met at a networking we event. Did, yeah, Curtis yeah. Marshall, shout out to you, <laughs> put together, I think it was a BYU game at the Delta Center back in the day. The basketball game. Yeah, yeah. we didn't watch anything. We're just <laughs> hanging out and chilling. I'm like, hey, I've heard a ton about you. And you're like, yeah, I've heard about you. I'm like, cool, let's go to lunch sometime. Like, literally just networking as we're talking about it. I don't want to go meet a bunch of random people. I mean, I knew two or three people there, but... I did it. I got out of my comfort zone. And now you look at how you've been able to help me. I've been able to help you. And that's always the goal in networking. It's not like people think. People think all the time networking is you're going to be this schmoozer and this butt kisser and you're going to be fake. No, it's not networking. Right. Those are the people you avoid. Well, and I don't even have business cards because if you have a business card in your pocket, you probably are coming from the wrong state of mind, right? Just that idea of like, I got to get this guy my card. So all I'm thinking about is like, there's nothing in it for me when I meet somebody. It's I literally, are we going to connect? Are we going to like each other? Is this going to be a friendship that's formed? And we do that. And if it forms, it's not hard to look you up the next day on Facebook if I like you, right? Like even in the moment, like if it's like you're afraid the person's never going to talk to you again, it's like it's a small world now. If I meet you through friends, which 98% of networking is in some mm -hmm. regard, and if it's not, you're probably doing it wrong anyways, then I shouldn't be too worried about my ability to connect with you again, especially if we just have a good interaction. And so I always tell people, I'm like, go into these networking events and talk about everything but business. Get curious about people and ideas and then friendships form. People feel authenticity and they want to be around you as opposed to the guy that's like, I wanna have the biggest network or I wanna be the most network guy. That never works. Like nobody wants to be around that person anyway. No, I mean, think of this. You go on TV, right? And you're watching your TV show. Are you excited when a commercial comes on? I mean, these days with DVR, <laughs> you're pissed. Like literally, you're pissed. You're like, when is this two minute commercial, all these commercials gonna be done? Well, it's the same thing when you go to a networking event or just in general, if you meet someone anywhere, it doesn't matter. Just go and become a professional at learning how to make friends. And that's what you just described there. Become a professional at just being that person. Like mm -hmm. literally, I'm not trying to say it in a, in a high school negative way of being cool. Just be cool. Like be cool where... You're somebody that someone wants to hang out with. You're not somebody different. And I think it's it's a fine line between being cool and trying to act cool, right? Yes. Because nobody wants no nobody cares about the guy that's acting cool. Yep. Like if you're trying to be cool, I always say this, like even you can be the richest, smartest, funniest, 
cool, you know, whatever person ever, but nobody's going to care secretly. They're going to cheer against you if you don't make them yeah. feel better about themselves. So the key to all networking is how does those people feel when they're in your presence and how are you making them feel in that moment? And that's the difference between being cool versus acting like you're cool. Yeah, be real. I mean, John Maxwell says the best. He says, people don't care, right? People don't care how much you know until they know how much you care. And it sounds so simple. Yeah, it makes sense. It's common sense. But think about it. When you're in a conversation, how much are you doing of the talking? Just think about it. Every single time you have a conversation, I want you to come back after and say, okay, did I dominate the conversation? What I Was I over 50% or was I below it? And if you did a really good job, hopefully you're only one third of the conversation. That person's going to walk away feeling like a million bucks if you spent most of the time asking them questions about themselves. Because whether people say it or not, whether they're an introvert or an extrovert, people love talking about themselves. If you start asking about their job and their work and their passions and their hobbies and the things that they're excited about, and they love just talking about it, and you're going to make people feel like a million bucks where after they're going to be like, I really like that person. They may not even know you because you didn't speak, but they're going to say, I like that person. Yeah. Now, I, I'm listening back to a few of the early podcasts that I, when I first started, because I didn't know how to do this. I still don't know <laughs> what I'm doing. But I had, there was a couple of the interviews and, um, where I caught myself and I didn't think it was what I was talking too much. And so I, I really studied how to like do the podcast the right way. And in my own conversations, I've been paying a lot more attention to that as well. As there's a saying, I don't remember who says this, is you got two ears and one mouth. That's a good way to remember the portion that you should be talking Emerson. versus listening. There you go. Uh, I also think of the office episode where Michael, it's when uh, Holly first gets introduced and Michael's talking about her to Jim and, and Michael's like, oh my gosh, did you see the new P, uh, HR lady? And and Jim goes, what did you learn about her? And, you know, Michael's like, oh, her booty does not stop, you know? And he's like, yeah, but what did you learn about her? You know, and it's like, <laughs> I always think about that as like that idea of like when you meet somebody, you should be able to walk away and tell somebody multiple things you learned about somebody or you've kind of probably screwed up the, the way that you met them, right? And so, so somebody that maybe is listening to this, right? This all sounds great. I'm, I'm liking the ideas and everything, but give me a couple, give them a couple hints or a couple, call it uh, clues or tricks or something when they're networking to help them get in a state where they can come from the right place and meet those people the right way. Do you have any examples or just some Yeah, there's that? a lot of different examples. I mean, one way, one really simple way is actually social media. And you can always meet new people everywhere, but on social media, it's a great way in the sense of you already have a collection of incredible friends and incredible network that most people haven't tapped into. And think about it this way. It doesn't matter how good you are at something, how credible you are, how likable you are. If they don't think of you, you're not networking. Mm. So one way is, is social media of not being the person that's annoying, not being the person that's pitching their business, not being the person, that's called face spam. It's called Facebook. It's not face spam, sure. right? Okay, yeah, yeah. spam's disgusting. If you like it, I apologize. It's disgusting. So you don't want to be face spamming people. But if you look at it, if you're posting consistent content, then people start to know. And let's say you're focused and let's say you're, you're a realtor. Let's say you're a loan officer. Let's say you're whatever in the financial industry. Provide value on the market, right? I mean, that's even what you do with your emails that you send out. Provide value. Become the expert. Share 80% on family and friends and lifestyle because then people get to know you, right? They know you. They, you start to bridge that gap of trust, but you want to start creating credibility. Instead of pitching them and being in their face, why not provide value? Why not provide some sort of story? The next thing is, is lunches. We talked about it. You should just create a list of people you want to get to know better Stay in touch with them. Go to lunch. We go to lunch every couple months. Go to lunch with a couple, maybe your top 20 contacts. Maybe for you, it's your top five. Maybe for some people, they want to put this thing on steroids and it's top 30 or 40. But you're going to eat lunch anyways. You might as well maximize it. And the last thing I'll say, and I know you do a lot of these things. I've done a thing that's the 250 challenge. And this is one of the things that I talk about in the book that I found this after and I was already doing this. And I can't even remember his name. Wrote the book. I can't even remember his name. But the best car salesman ever, what he does is he collects everybody's information. And he reaches out to these people 
every single month. He reaches out to about 250 people a month. And he wishes them happy birthday. And all he does is just simple reach out. That's it. Nothing else. It's called pinging, right? It's in the book, Never Eat Alone. Keith Ferrazzi talks about pinging. That's his term. And he does it and that's it. He doesn't ask for anything, but just by staying in contact with them, he increases his likability. He increases his credibility, which thus increases his recall ability. So they think about him. And then eventually when there's an opportunity for profitability, maybe it's just friendship, maybe it's mentorship, maybe it's referral, maybe it's transaction, it happens. So I've done this now for 11 years, 11 years where I reach out and I send 250 different messages a month. Now, sometimes it's the same people from three months ago. There's some overlap. Sometimes it's new people with no agenda at all, just to ping, just to say hello, just to stay in contact. Something that's as simple as just a voice message of, Hey, just saw your team got their butt kicked in the Super Bowl. Sucks to be you, you know, like joking around or just saw you just, you guys just had a new baby. Like congratulations, happy birthday, simple. That's it. Those are three things that imagine if you did that for a year, two years, five years, it starts to accumulate and the best interest, much better than anything else there out there is your network. If you keep building that network, nothing pays more interest than building that network. Nothing. Well, and I love that idea because nothing on the other end of that, right? Like if you're reaching out to me all the time and creating value every time you post or mention me in something or whatever else, then when you do reach out, maybe needing something, I'm going to be a lot more prone to want to help you out. Nothing's more annoying. I get calls from people I haven't heard from in four or six years. And the first thing they do is they ask me for something. Like I noticed your friends with so-and-so. I want to do this. Can you connect me? Can you set up the meeting for us? And it's like, dude, you haven't reached out to me in six years. Like I'm happy to help my friends, but this just feels like you're trying to use a relationship that you no longer have. Right. And so I don't know. I just, for me, I have my, I have three lists. I have like what I call my elite um, group of friends. Okay. And not elite in the sense that they're like above others, but to me, that relationship is very the inner strong. circle. Yeah. It's like the inner circle. Yeah. And I got about 240 people in there. And then I have my A group, which is another like 500. And then I've got my B group, which is kind of everybody else. Uh, I'm friends. We know each other, but we're not necessarily hanging out on a regular basis. And that elite group, at least once a month, I have to reach out to every one of them. And it's one of the reasons why people always like, you know, what, don't you mind the driving and everything as a realtor? And it's like, no, that's, I mean, I'm just on the phone making calls all day long. And sometimes it's for nothing, right? Me and you will talk about the dumbest stuff yeah. sometimes, or I'll just tell you I liked your video on Facebook or whatever it was. So. Or we'll make bets about the NBA, just small <laughs> right. little fun bets. Right, little bets because you're a Celtics <laughs> fan and I don't like anything I'm that not, has to do I'm with Gordon Lake Hayward. Fan. So. <laughs> that was, I think, why I was even more bugged about the whole <laughs> Celtics thing. But no, um, well, and you said another important principle is, is talking about social media real quick. Um, I always say social media is like a room full of random group of your friends. Picture 50 random friends from all wakes of life, right? And they're sitting in a room. What would you come in and talk to that group about? Or what would you say to them as your friend? And that's what you should post on social media. You'd never walk into a group of 50 of your random friends that were all just hanging out, say for your birthday or something, right? And be like, guys, I just listed this new house. It's on. It's in South Jordan. It's a $420,000 house. That's like when realtors post that stuff. You're like, stop. Private message me. Oh, wait. I didn't know I could private message you, but because you just said that, yeah, I'm all over that. It's like as soon as you see that, now you're less likely to private right. message Like imagine you. walking into a room with all your friends and be like, hey, anybody that's interested, walk out now. Come see me. We're going to – you know, it's just – it's such so salesy. It just comes off that way. But so, okay. So that's a great principle. You covered a lot of stuff right there. Um, give us a couple other things. What's the, your main key principle for now? What's like, what's the two or three main things that people really got to get through to become great at networking? Yeah. So I would say there's four main things. Okay. Um, the first thing is, is you have to increase your likability. It sounds simple. And what I did is I created very simple laws and then inside those laws, I go very deep, even body language of little things of, you know, people's feet say everything about them. I mean, look at a couple and watch a couple for a while and you see their feet. And if they're like this and their legs are kind of, you know, over here, you can tell. And look at a kid when you tell a kid they're going to Disneyland and you see their feet. So I go through a lot of little things for reading people and just increasing your likability. Simple things, even smiling. Go watch somebody and go watch them and just people watch for a couple minutes and go judge who you think is happy and who isn't, and it will be all based off just facial expression. So for me, 
I didn't naturally smile a lot. I wasn't in a bad mood. I'm always pretty much in a good mood, but I'm just even keel. Mm -hmm. So I've had to actually practice that. And you've seen how many times I just naturally smile during the interview. That's not natural for me. It's become more so. And so I go through all of the things of specific techniques, not just ideas, but specific techniques on how to increase your likability. So then I think of it for networking. We've all got that family member, right? You've got that. You don't need to name them because they're probably watching this podcast. They're probably not if they're not as likable. <laughs> but you got that family member that you just love to death and they're great. But you would never, ever refer them. Ever. Just You just wouldn't. And why is that? It's because they don't have the credibility. So the second law that we've talked about a lot is you've got to go create your greatness once at something. And even if it's completely different industry, you, that helps you to parlay that. So you can par I could parlay my tennis career into networking. You can parlay your baseball career and you know what it takes to be successful into real estate. So you've got to become great at something, create credibility. Then yes, in that specific industry, you want to create that greatness to create that credibility. Third law. So I started testing all these with, I had hundreds of pages of notes. I had to just put it all down and I said, okay, is that it? Just those two laws, that's it. And I was actually with Woody Woodward. We were at Paradise Bakery for four to five hours just going through all this, just testing, testing, testing. Well, and Woody is a success coach. I think he's episode like 16. If you go on and go back and listen to that episode, Woody goes into in-depth details about your uh, emotional fingerprint and all that kind of stuff. Very, he's, very excellent. He's, he's the best. so, so, so very good. Very good strategy. Close coach. friend. We always, all of us mastermind together. So then we went through it and we said, that's not it. Because it doesn't matter how likable you are. It doesn't matter how credible you are. If I haven't seen you for 10 years, I have no idea what you're doing. And that's why we were talking about this earlier, the law of recallability, mm. then I'm not going to network with you. So you need to make sure that that third law, you're figuring out a way, whether it's lunch, whether it's text messages, voice messages, whether it's a little bit of social media, whether you're even commenting on theirs. As you said, you can't reach out and say, Hey, Jimmy, haven't spoken to you in six years, but uh, I've got this thing I want you to look at. Or I want you to do this business with me. I had the exact same situation happen to me years ago. Hadn't talked to this guy for 10 years. He's like, hey, I'd really love to catch up. I was pretty excited to catch up with this guy. <laughs> Catches up with me. This is even worse. For 30 minutes, 30 minutes, at least he could have said, hey, the real reason why I called is I'm in the financial industry and then catch up. Well, I even tell people, I teach people, if you're going to call with business first, come out of the door yes. with business. Like, hey, this is actually a business call. Do you have two minutes? Sure, what's up? Then catch up because then at least you, people know you're coming from a good We're spot. We're exactly the same. This is exactly what I teach. I say, the real reason why I called Jimmy, hey, I'd love to catch up with you regardless, <laughs> but, and at least say it, at least come out. This guy catches with me for 30 minutes and he's like, oh, by the way, I just got in the financial industry. And I just thought, no, I don't, I don't really care. No, it just bothered me so bad. And guess what? Even worse, hasn't reached out since. And now it's been probably six or seven years. Right. I mean, at least follow up after that, but it hasn't even done that. So that's the third law. I thought after that, for sure, we're done. Likeability, credibility, recallability. What else is there? And I thought, what would make... A transaction goes sour. And remember, transaction can be friendship, mentorship, can be anything. It could be money, it could be anything. And it's the law of profitability because you have to create a win-win situation. Because if I come to you and we, we've got the likability, the credibility, the recallability, and I say, Jimmy, I got this deal for you. You're going to get paid a dollar. I'm going to get paid a million dollars. The law of profitability isn't there. Now, sometimes, like I said, sometimes it could just be someone with mentorship, sure. with friendship, with connections. But you have to make sure you create that win-win scenario. Otherwise, you don't meet those laws. And everything I've tested, everything fits into those four laws. And if you fit into those four laws and you keep focusing on, okay, everybody's deficient in some place. Maybe for you that you're watching this, maybe your likability is through the roof. Maybe your credibility is through the roof and your likability isn't. Maybe both those are, but your recallability sucks. So you figure out where you're most deficient and then you say, okay, how can I get a little bit better at that specific law? Because I promise you, you look at the most successful people right now, they build networks. Mm -hmm. You've got to build a network. And all the time, my people come to me saying, hey, I need a job right now. That's, that's like Noah. Noah, the flood comes. Hey, um, sorry, I didn't build my ark. The flood's here. Can, can you help me out? Too late. 
Yeah. You got to build your ark before the flood comes. The best time to network is when you don't need anything at all. And most people don't understand that. Well, I get it because I, I have a friend, my friend Tom, and he reached out to me. This was just two days ago. And he's like, hey, man, there's a job opening at Vivint Solar. I know you have a lot of friends over there. Would you be interested? I mean, would you help me out here in helping me just get my resume in the right place? And this guy's been sending me referrals for four or five years. Yeah. I talked to the head of the company. Like, I got his resume to whoever needed to see the thing. I don't, we'll follow up and see what happens. But, like, that was sitting on the desk of the COO by the end of the day because he, for years, didn't ask anything from me. He wasn't trying to use my relationship. He simply said, dude, I kind of need you here. I know you have a connection here. It's not going to cost you anything. And I was happy to help him because for years, this guy's been helping me build my brand and my business. And he's just been a good friend. And it wasn't like I never hear from this guy. I hear from him every couple of months. He'll just reach out and say hello and different things like that. So that's an example of something where I was like, I'm happy to do everything. But you I just can. said something that's really key. He just gave, 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 gave. It's a bank account. Right. And it was deposit, deposit, deposit. Too many times people network and they hear all these lies and principles. They have this hidden agenda. Of course you want to have a better life. But you have to look at it if just focus on becoming a better person, a better friend. And maybe the next 10 friends you make friends with, maybe it's just going to be for you helping them. Maybe you're not going to, there's going to be nothing that they give to you. You just don't know. But if you do it for the right reasons, mm -hmm. I promise you karma is real. I promise you it will come back tenfold, a hundredfold, a thousandfold. Well, and what's cool is you do it. Because here's what I've kind of discovered. Like I did it long enough where you just, you just do things for people. You have no expectation. Like my father, I love him. Um, but the one thing my dad, he did a lot of things. He attached, um, he, he always wanted something to come from it. Like he always attached like, and, and, and since I did this, I, you should do this for me. And I hated that. And I, so I always kind of went the opposite direction. No expectation, trade all expectation for appreciation, like Tony Robbins 101. And just do it because you want to do it with no expectation attached to it. And when you do it long enough, here's the part that I was getting at is you see the reward come over and over and over. So now you know, like I know when I do certain things, it's like this podcast, like I didn't have any agenda here. I just like, people are like, why is he doing the podcast? I'll ask my <laughs> friends. They're like, well, I think he just wants to do it. But it's like, at the end of the day, I know some great things will come out of this. Just being able to sit with you for an hour and a half and my other friends that I'm able to sit down with and, and really get that FaceTime with is worth doing it. One day my kids or something might pick this up and be like, oh, this is what dad had to say about that topic. But I know how many benefits come from just doing something with no expectation attached. I don't know what comes out of it. And if nothing comes out of it, I'm still glad we're sitting here doing this today. And with that attitude towards anything that you do, people sense that, they can feel that, and they're happy to be a part of whatever it is you're doing. Yeah, I just created a transaction with a friend, just huge, huge transaction. And this is just basically from networking as friends. And you know, I always put together functions. You always put together functions. I didn't think I would ever get anything. Honestly, if you would have told me, hey, you're going to bet on this. Bet a million dollars one way or the other. I would have said, there's no way. Nothing's going to come out of this. You don't know. Mm -hmm. And a huge transaction came out of that. Same thing. I'm going to Lake Powell. I've got 100 people coming. I called Jimmy. I'm like, I don't know how to run 100 people at Lake Powell. I said, Jimmy, can you come help run it? I'll pay you whatever you need to get paid. He said, no, you can't pay me. I was bothered because now I feel like I owe this guy. He's like, no, it's all good. He's like, I'm like, but a bunch of these people are from out of state. I don't know if they're ever going to buy from you. And I'm feeling bad because I want to be the person that's the giver. But you're like, no, it's all good. You just don't know. And if you do the right things for the right reasons, that's why you're always taking care of people. I'm always trying to the best of my ability, doing different groups, different get togethers. I just did one for the Super Bowl. I do them constantly throughout the year, put together different groups and just have fun. And if you do that, the host always gets the most. Remember that. Mm -hmm. The host always gets the most. And sometimes it can be scary. So you can just start really small. It can just be a dinner function. Have a bunch of people over dinner. You can go bowling if you want to. I don't care what it is. But the host always gets the most. Oh, it's such a great principle. It's, it's one of those things where it's like I used to – the reason I really started throwing a lot of parties originally, I, I noticed that very principle, right? I'm like, no one really cares if you show up to a party, but everybody's all, every, if you throw a great party, everyone's always like, whose party is this? And I kind of caught onto that. I was like, oh, I should throw great parties. Like, that sounds fun. Like, that's a cool way to get to know people better, right? So I, I think that principle, um, and people do get scared. Like my brother, he's like, he's a total introvert, my brother Dale. If I give him a client in real estate, it's done. Those people can <laughs> go 
get their keys. Like the dude is as good as they come for getting someone close. He's not a natural extrovert go out and network. And so it's kind of cool. I like what you said is start small because we made a goal with him just to invite a different family over a few times this year for a Sunday dinner or just to have dinner with them, right? Just random families that are kind of in his neighborhood or from his sports coaching team and just say, hey, come on over. And, and he came up with that idea on his own. He's like, I'm, I can do that. Like, I'm not going to host the whole party. If I'm out of town, trust me, we're not having the party. Like, it's, <laughs> you know, he's not going to get a thousand people together and he, he just, it's not who he is. But you put him in front of a couple people and nobody's better. And so he's starting that way and it'll be fun to watch as that grows for him as well because I know it will because it does for everybody. Yeah, you don't see someone that says I want to go run a half marathon unless you're Jimmy who goes and just does it. <laughs> I ran a full marathon. I know. <laughs> I saw. You don't go teach somebody that wants to run a half marathon. You say, okay, we're running the full you know, the full right now half marathon. I mean, if you're a coach at least and you're not crazy like this guy, you're going to say, let's go, let's go run a mile today. Let's go run two miles and you're going to work your way up. Same thing for networking. You're not going to say, okay, let's go do a fireworks show and have three, five, six, seven thousand people here. Let's go. No, you start small. Just do dinner groups. So for all of you, you can figure out what's your one takeaway. Everybody has one takeaway. You can start small. You can come back and say, okay, now what can I integrate? What can I implement? But the most difficult thing is, is everybody always, most people figure out what they need to do. Very few people actually go do it. Mm. And if you read the seven highly effective habits in there, there's an essay that Stephen Covey talks about, the most common denominator of success. And this, I always forget his name, E.M. Gra e. Gray, E.M. Shaw, it's E.M. something, just go with E.M. So E.M., he says in that he studied most of his life, the difference between successful people and those that aren't successful. And he said, it's not that successful people love doing the things that unsuccessful people don't do. It's that they're willing to do it anyways. So you got to have that discipline. Discipline is the mo mother and father of being consistent and persistent. Everybody has the ideas and they figure out, okay, I need to do this. But very few actually take the action to do it. They're always in tomorrow land and successful people know there is no tomorrow land. It's no, let's wreck some havoc. What can I make happen right now? And then you prioritize. Because yes, we've, everybody has life. Everybody's busy. That's the, isn't that cliche word nowadays? Pretty How much. you doing? I'm busy. I mean, it just makes, I say it still. It just makes people feel important. How you doing? Oh, I'm just so busy right now. I mean, it's, we're all busy. Yeah. Everybody's busy. What are you busy doing? Yeah. Well, I, it's funny. I had a guy, um, a kid, I should say, he'd been home from his LDS mission like six months here in Utah. And he's, he just got his real estate license. And he heard me speak a couple of weeks ago and he, sent me an email and asked me if I'd go to lunch. So we went to Jamba Juice today, literally. And we're sitting there and we're talking and he's taking notes and the kids, he's excited. So I'm excited to teach him and he's smart. He's reaching out to somebody who's where he wants to be. And then at the end of it, he goes, this was all great, man. He goes, who were two or three other people I can sit down with that you know that I can you know, learn some other things from? And I said, bro, I just gave you five years worth of information. <laughs> you need to just go do it. Like, this is the problem with the younger generation. I straight told him, I said, dude, you want to learn. And I go, when I started out, I literally went to the back of the Realtor magazine. There was a classified ad. One guy had a system on how to sell real estate. I literally called a 1-800 number and I got a CD in the mail and I listened to it and I went and did what he said because I didn't know where else to go. But I was doing things and deals were happening. I said, I literally just gave you like five years worth of work to do in this 25, 30 minute meeting. Just start going and doing. Like quit worrying about studying or needing to be an expert. You need to just go do now. And he kind of laughed. He goes, yeah, that is kind of my problem. I'm like, yeah, no kidding. Like just you need to go do it now. Like, you know, so it was just kind of funny to me, but I think too often, you know, like we, it is easier to just sit home. It's easier not to go approach somebody that you're uncomfortable with. It's easier to be in the corner or not at the party or to leave early than to really put a full effort into being a, an asset to whatever's going on. And so I think that principle is, is so powerful that like, it's not that I always want to be like out doing all these things either, but I'm willing to do them because I know there's a lot of people can benefit from, you know, expanding my own network and doing these things and I can help essentially a lot of other people bring happiness into their lives. Yeah. And it, there's a great quote that I learned years ago. It says, training doesn't work, work trains. Mm. And I thought that, but if I don't get training, how am I supposed to know? But then I thought that, and everybody wants to make the plan for the plan of the plan of the plan. And they're in ideation phase. And what you need to do is you just need to write down is what I'm doing right now, making me the most amount of money. 
Now, whatever that is, it could be, yes, it's planting seeds and it starts out with a little bit of networking, right? It could, whatever it is, wherever you're at in your business, in your job, in your industry, in life, but is what I'm doing right now making me the most amount of money? Because everybody wants to figure out how to be busy because then in their minds, they feel like they're working hard and success will come. But deep down, deep down, they know they're not doing what they're supposed to do. And if you're not doing what you're supposed to, guess what? You're taking a deposit and, and instead of making a deposit, you're actually taking a withdrawal of trust in yourself. Mm -hmm. And if you can't trust yourself, how can you expect anyone else to trust you? So your credibility, it's a facade. It's a fake. So you got to do what you say you're going to do. Do what you know you're supposed to do if you want to have success, if you want to crack that credibility code, because otherwise, you know, I mean, you know, in any industry, it doesn't matter what they're in, they know what they're supposed to do. And they try to find the, the 10 things that they're supposed to do. And they try to find the nine that aren't that big of a deal. And oh, I'll do the other thing tomorrow and tomorrow. And the people that crush it, that are successful, they do what they're supposed to do. They do, they do what they know they need to do. When the marketplace will pay you for doing the work that others won't. That's the bottom line. Whatever that is, whatever industry in, the marketplace will pay you a value if, if you're willing and able to do work that nobody else will. So, dude, this has been awesome. I, uh, how do people get the book if people want to get your book and read it and learn? Because you're big on Facebook as well, right? Is that the best place to find you? Yeah, you can go on Amazon. It's called The Game of Networking. You just look that up, The Game of Networking, Rob Sperry. And you'll find it right there. Simple. We all love Amazon. Who doesn't love Amazon? Uh, you can get the Audible version as well. If you get the Audible version, you can always put it on two or three times speed. You're going to hear me talk like a chipmunk, <laughs> but that's okay. You can get through it real quick. I think the Audible version is five hours. And if you let it listen, like I was listening two times speed. Uh, so you'll finish that thing in twice, two and a half Twice hours. as long yeah, as this podcast. Yeah, 100%. Person, <laughs> Awesome. Well, hey, I appreciate you, man. And I've learned so much from watching you and, you know, growing my own business using the principles you've taught me. So thanks so much. Great for having you on. Appreciate it. Thanks, my man.